White House table setting. President Donald Trump is set to go to Philadelphia late this week, as the White House attempts to creep toward some semblance of normalcy. Two governors are slated to come to meet with the president at the White House, North Dakota Republican Gov. Doug Burgum and Colorado Democratic Gov. Jared Polis. Polis was one of the earliest to begin to open his state. The administration is also in the midst of planning two events to begin to try to demonstrate that it is ready to deal with the long tail of COVID-19 going into the fall. They plan to highlight increased testing capability and availability of personal protective equipment. Meanwhile, the country is having to reckon with 20.5 million Americans losing their jobs last month. Unemployment is at the highest since the Great Depression and there is no clear picture as to whether those jobs will return once the country reopens. More than 1.2 million Americans have tested positive for COVID-19 and more than 77,000 Americans have died from the disease. The messaging on the Sunday shows from several Trump administration officials was far from painting a seamless reopening of the economy. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin signaled Sunday that unemployment could be as high as 25% when pressed in an interview with Chris Wallace on Fox News Sunday. We could be, Mnuchin said. He added, the reported numbers are probably gonna get worse before they get better. More from Maya Parthasarathy. Kevin Hassett, White House economic advisor, told Margaret Brennan on CBS, Face the Nation, that unemployment will trough in May or June with a rate north of 20 percent. And as to whether the jobs that Americans believe will come back in six months will actually exist, Hassett said, nobody knows it. Larry Kudlow, White House National Economic Council director, told George Stephanopoulos on ABC's This Week that the numbers for May are going to be also very difficult. Administration officials continued to slow walk the timeline for a phase four stimulus package. Hassett told Jake Tapper on CNN's State of the Union that another stimulus package right now is premature. More Hassett, W. E. think that we have a little moment, the luxury of a moment, to learn about what's going on, so that the next step that we take can be prudent. Back on Capitol Hill, House Democrats are still working on putting together the next coronavirus stimulus package. No word yet on when Speaker Nancy Pelosi will call members back to Washington. From 30 feet Michael Cruz, Donald Trump's lifelong obsession with comebacks, that Trump, in the throes of the worst public health crisis in more than a century and the most devastating economic downturn since the Great Depression, is writing rosy history long before it has actually happened might seem audacious. It borders on the fanciful when considering the slew of numbers, the steadily mounting death toll, near record unemployment and a majority of Americans dissatisfied with his handling of the crisis, that sketch a future trending in the opposite direction. But this is a page from a playbook Trump has used many times before. At key points in Trump's long and public life, from his nadir in the 1990s to The Apprentice, more than a decade later to his embattled campaign a decade after that and finally to his tumultuous presidency, Trump has used the idea of the comeback as a critical weapon in his arsenal of self-invention. A believer in a binary worldview that was a core teaching of his flinty father, there are winners and losers, and he always must be the former, not the latter. Trump has used comeback as a fortifying piece of rhetoric that masks periods of failure, delaying a reckoning until there's something to brag about. Others might wait for actual evidence that a comeback has occurred, but Trump repeatedly has advertised his comebacks months and even years in advance. He has used it to bend in his favor unflattering media narratives, to tweak perception, to alter reality, to conjure power, positivity and a sense of propulsion, especially at junctures when he's running low on all three. In Trump's hometown, Why the Path to Reopening New York City Will Be So Difficult, by NYT's J. David Goodman and Michael Rothfield, the factors that made the city the U.S. epicenter of the pandemic, its density, tourism and dependence on mass transit, complicate a return to any semblance of normalcy. The city is still far from meeting the public health metrics necessary to reopen, from available critical care beds to new hospital admissions for the virus. While states like Colorado, Georgia and Texas have let the stay-at-home orders lapse and businesses like nail salons and retail stores reopen, New York State is moving cautiously, anticipating a partial reopening later this month, mostly in rural areas. 
NYT. Good Sunday morning. Happy Mother's Day. Happening tomorrow, Anna and Jake will host a virtual playbook interview with Democratic operative Lee Smith at 9 a.m. Sign up. The market today. America's smallest stocks are staging a comeback. By WSJ's Akane Otani, shares of small U.S. companies are racing higher, stirring a debate among investors about how much longer the stock market can keep rallying despite some of the grimmest economic news since the Great Depression. The market's rally over the past several weeks has stood in contrast to the economic data investors have gotten since the coronavirus pandemic erupted. Friday's Labor Department report showed the U.S. economy shed a record 20.5 million jobs in April. Analysts warn the pain will likely last longer, even as some states have moved to reopen businesses and lift stay-at-home orders. None of that has stopped investors from putting money back into small capitalization companies, a striking phenomenon, given their fate, more than multinationals, is intertwined with the health of the domestic economy. In the coming days, investors will get a look at data including a reading of optimism among small businesses, retail sales and consumer confidence. WSJ. Siren, Dan Goldberg, three top U.S. health chiefs enter self-quarantines, three top-ranking Trump administration health officials are in some form of quarantine after possible exposure in the White House, forcing them to self-isolate from a disease they are responsible for fighting. CDC Director Robert Redfield and Anthony Fauci, the government's top infectious disease expert, on Saturday evening disclosed plans to isolate over the next two weeks after low-risk contact with an infected person. A day earlier, FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn began two weeks of self-quarantine after coming in contact with White House spokesperson Katie Miller, who tested positive for COVID-19 on Friday. WAPO's Sung Min Kim, Josh Dossi and Amy Goldsetin, White House aides rattled after positive coronavirus tests and officials send mixed messages on how to respond. The White House on Saturday scrambled to deal with the fallout from two aides testing positive for the coronavirus, as officials who were potentially exposed responded differently, with some senior members of the pandemic task force self-quarantining while others planned to continue to go to work. Dot, dot, dot. But several administration officials said White House staffers were encouraged to come into the office by their supervisors, and that aides who travel with President Trump and Vice President Pence would not stay out for 14 days, the recommended time frame to quarantine once exposed to the virus. The conflicting ways in which officials and aides are responding after two staff members were diagnosed with the coronavirus this past week, Pence spokeswoman Katie Miller and a military valet to the president, continued to raise questions about how the White House is responding to the challenge of maintaining a safe work environment for Trump, Pence and their staff. The White House press office declined to comment Saturday on whether employees beyond Miller and the military aide have been told to self-quarantine. WAPO. Meanwhile, Adam Cancryn, Fauci and Burks's public withdrawal worries health experts. President Donald Trump's oscillations over the fate of his coronavirus task force have tapped into a growing fear within the nation's public health community that at a critical juncture in the pandemic fight, the government's top health experts might still be seen, but increasingly not heard. The Trump administration in recent weeks has clamped down on messaging, largely shifting its focus to cheerleading a restart of the nation's economy even as states and businesses clamor for guidance on how to do so safely. Key health agencies remain relegated to the background. Some congressional requests for health officials' testimony are being rejected. And though the task force is still intact, it has not held a press briefing for 13 days, the longest the public has gone without having Anthony Fauci or Deborah Burks at the White House podium since the briefings began in late February. Politico. Sunday Best. Chuck Todd interviewed Sen Lamar Alexander, R10, on NBC's Meet the Press, about what Congress will do next. Alexander, well, there's not enough money to help everybody hurt when you shut down the government. So the only solution is test, trace, isolate, treatments, and vaccines. So the fast track on testing is the only solution to this. So we have to reopen the economy. We have to do it carefully. We have to let people go back to work and earn a living. And I don't see us being able to appropriate much more money to help provide a counter to that. 
Ohio Gov. Mike DeWine, R. Ohio, told Chris Wallace he would veto a bill from the state legislature that would try to curb executive power on stay-at-home orders. DeWine, I've made clear to the legislature that if that reached us, and I don't think it will, but I would veto that. Look I understand Chris that people are anxious to get back, that has people hurting, I mean we can't underestimate the businesses that are suffering, we can't underestimate the workers who don't have jobs, so that's why we have to move forward. But we have to move forward very, very carefully. Jake Tapper spoke with Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms on her potential as a VP candidate, Bottoms, I think I'm a pretty great person. I don't know if my husband will agree with that. But I certainly think that Joe Biden has the right to pick whomever he thinks will help propel him to victory in November. So, it's an honor to have my name spoken in that light. But being mayor of Atlanta right now is a, more than a full-time job, continuing to lead our city, but also in the midst of COVID-19. In the West Wing, Meadows learns to navigate Kushner's sprawling White House influence, by Anita Kumar. When the White House's top domestic policy job came open in recent weeks, newly installed Chief of Staff Mark Meadows was quick to suggest a surprising name, Stephen Miller. The proposal, described by three people familiar with the situation, would place Miller, the hard-charging force behind the administration's immigration policies, in a more well-defined role as Meadows worked to reshape the West Wing. But Jared Kushner, President Donald Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor, intervened. He suggested others he had worked with at the White House. Eventually Derek Lyons, who is viewed as close to Kushner, became the new acting director of the Domestic Policy Council. The episode provided an early and important lesson for Meadows. The White House is rife with competing power centers, and Kushner is often the most powerful force behind Trump himself. Six weeks into his tenure as chief of staff, Meadows is adjusting to the ways of a White House, where the president often announces policy changes with little discussion and many decisions become opportunities for various factions to advance their agendas. And Kushner is the figure who has consistently loomed large over those choices, according to nine current and former senior administration officials and Republicans close to the White House, most of whom did not want to use their name to speak freely. Politico. 2020 conventions, WAPO's Josh Dossey, Michael Shearer and Annie Linsky, the Republican National Committee has asked the federal government to provide personal protective gear for political conventions this summer, underscoring the challenges of staging the quadrennial events during a pandemic that has already caused the deaths of more than 78,000 Americans. RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel said in an interview that the gear was needed for both conventions because they are national security events and that she had recently begun talking to Trump administration officials about such a request. WAPO. Trump's Sunday. The president has nothing on his public schedule. Clicker, SNL, cold open virtual graduation with Alec Baldwin. Watch. The new Cold War. Trump and chip makers including Intel seek semiconductor self-sufficiency. By WSJ's Asa Fitch, Kate O'Keefe and Bob Davis, the Trump administration and semiconductor companies are looking to jumpstart development of new chip factories in the U.S. as concern grows about reliance on Asia as a source of critical technology. A new crop of cutting-edge chip factories in the U.S. would reshape the industry and mark a U-turn after decades of expansion into Asia by many American companies eager to reap investment incentives and take part in a robust regional supply chain. The coronavirus pandemic has underscored long-standing concern by U.S. officials and executives about protecting global supply chains from disruption. Administration officials say they are particularly concerned about reliance on Taiwan, the self-governing island China claims as its own, and the home of Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Co., the world's largest contract chip manufacturer and one of only three companies capable of making the fastest, most cutting-edge chips. Trump administration officials are in talks with Intel Corp., the largest American chip maker, and with TSMC, to build factories in the U.S., according to correspondence viewed by the Wall Street Journal and people familiar with the discussions. WSJ. HMM. In the early days of the pandemic, the U.S. government turned down an offer to manufacture millions of N95 masks in America, by WAPO's Aaron C. Davis. 
Virus Conspiracists Elevate a New Champion, by Dave Alba, The Rise of Dr. Mycobits is the latest twist in the virus disinformation wars, which have swelled throughout the pandemic. Conspiracy theorists have used the uncertainty and fear around the disease to mint many villains. Those include Dr. Fauci after he appeared to slight President Trump and Mr. Gates, a co-founder of Microsoft, as someone who started the disease. They have also pushed the baseless idea that 5G wireless waves can help cause the disease. On the flip side, they have created their own heroes, like Dr. Mikovits. The conspiracy theorists recast a pusher of discredited pseudoscience as a whistle-blowing counterpoint to real expertise, said René Deresta, a disinformation researcher at the Stanford Internet Observatory. Dr. Mikovits did not respond to requests for comment. NYT. Across the pond, UK expected to stick to lockdown as Johnson outlines future, by Apps Pan Pilas in London, taking a different tack than most other nations, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is expected to extend the bulk of the country's coronavirus lockdown restrictions for three weeks or so when he speaks to the nation Sunday evening. Following a week of mixed messages that started with Johnson indicating that there will be changes to the lockdown beginning Monday, the government has sought to douse speculation that they will amount to much. That's because the UK, which has recorded the most coronavirus-related deaths in Europe at 31,662, is still seeing a relatively high number of infections. AP Send tips to Eli Okun and Garrett Ross at Politico Playbook at politico.com Transition, Ethan Easterwood is joining Northrop Grumman as PAC manager. He previously was PAC manager at Lados. Welcome to the world, Daniel Kroos, Deputy Assistant Director at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency and a John Ratcliffe alum, and Mary Kroos, Senior Manager at U Group, welcomed Turner Calvin Kroos on April 30th. Pick. Another pick. Angel Arena, press secretary to former President Bill Clinton, and Lisette Flores, graduate administrator for NYU's English department, welcomed Zoe Simona Arena on Saturday afternoon. Pick. Birthdays, Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith, R. Miss, is 61. Representative Mike Kelly, R. Penn, is 72. Representative Pete Stauber, R. Min, is 54. Representative John Curtis, R. Utah, is 6-0. Gabe DiBenedetti, NY MAG National Correspondent. Andrew Card, Chairman of the National Endowment for Democracy, is 73. Craig Gordon, Washington Bureau Chief for Bloomberg News. Former Senator Dean Heller, R. Neb, is 6-0. Former Representative Steve Gunderson, R. Wiss, is 69. Stan Greenberg, CEO of Greenberg Research, is 75. Mel Sembler is 9-0. Finch Fulton, DOT's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Transportation Policy. Diana Dunn, Head of Government Affairs for the Milken Institute, H.T. Matthew Elshire. Farah Sonderling, Manager of Government Affairs at the American Forest and Paper Association, is 32. H.T. Samantha Dravis. Douglas Farrar, Managing Director at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, is 37. CNN's Jeremy Erb. Elise Italiano Urenic. Stephen M. Ross is 8 0. Rick Santorum is 62. Chris Tuttle. Politico's Andrew Desiderio. Courtney Rohrbach and Nick Collins. Shailen Hines. H. T. Kelly Love. Gary Goldberg. Senior Policy Director at Denton's. Christine McDonough. Clarence Tong. Veronique de Rugi. Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center. Hannah Beth Mooney. Brad Bannon. Michael Turk. John Maroney, Will Serio, Maggie Thomas, associate at Wiley Rain, is 3-0. Rachel Weisel, Lucy Jackson is 3-0. Abby Brandon, Adam Janofsky, Carter Foxgrover, Virginia State Dell, Mark Keane, Terry Holt, Kathleen O'Neill, Emily Dillard, Corbin Castile, Lance Gould, Andrew Binns, Bryant Avendoglio, Jocelyn Austin Cholowinski. Chris Policano, David Bethel is 73, Gannett Segai, Lisa Boyce, Amy Simon, H.T. Teresa Vilmaine, Tim Powderly of Apple, Ernan Rosenberg, Instagram's Divya Kunapuli, Ilona Vitsian, Dave Klusner, Grace Rao, Eric Curran, 